Hello, everyone, and welcome to the newest episode of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and for the first time ever on the show, we are joined by one of my former students. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully we will have many, many more to come in forthcoming episodes. I am joined today by Dustin Smith, who is a 2020 graduate of our beloved history program at Penn State Altoona. He has since gone on to attain his master's degree in American studies. And it is wonderful to have you here Great on the show. Here. Great to be here. Wonderful. Here. And I apologize to the audience starting off here. I'm going to have to do the old Michael Keaton <laughs> Batman turn throughout the episode. I had a bit of surgery on my neck, but um, yeah, ab absolutely great to be here. Uh, uh, historian well. presses on no matter what. <laughs> Dustin was a really great student. I think you took me for what, five or six classes? Easily, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was also the supervisor for Dustin's senior capstone, his senior research paper. Tell the good folks what you wrote about in that paper. Yeah, so my senior capstone focused on the role that submarines played during the Civil War. Um, throughout my childhood, I had this fascination with uh, Civil War naval technology. And just, it was that cusp of modernity with you know, some of the technology that was going on in the middle of the 19th century. And the Civil War was really the, the focal point of where all this technology came to, came to a head. And um, yeah, so I, I used to research, you know, the designs of some of the submarines that were um, being built and created during the time of the Civil War. And, you know, I, I wanted to take a look at some of the more uh, obscure pieces of, of underwater technology that were at play mm -hmm. in the Civil War there. And appropriately enough, today we are going to be taking a look at the 1999 TNT original entitled The Hunley. And so this is your first time watching the Hunley. First time, and as we were saying before filming today, I had absolutely no idea that this film existed. Uh, it seems to have uh, slipped under the water, Ooh, if you will. That's right. so, many, so many bad puns coming. There's going to be so many undersea puns today, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. All right. So <laughs> let's dive in. All right. Shall we? <laughs> let's dive in. Let's do it. I thought I'd resist there, you know, space them out a little bit, but what the hell? Let's go ahead and continue. Well, wow, starting right off with the sinking. Okay. One of them. <laughs> one of the one of the three. Spoiler alert, 160 years later. It certainly sets the scene with the claustrophobia and the desperation, which are these prevailing themes of submarine life during the Civil War. Absolutely, that is going to unfortunately follow this submarine and its, and its crew throughout the entirety of its service during the war. Somehow keeping that candle lit while water is being splashed around, I like it. As long as there's light, there's hope, <laughs> as the old saying goes. I love me some Randy Edelman. Randy Edelman also did the soundtrack for Gettysburg. Oh, okay. And also The Last of the Mohicans. So uh, all these historical films of the 1990s served his career very well, too. God, that was agonizing to watch. and We're not even five minutes in. The year before this film, John Gray had done another very successful TNT drama entitled The Day Lincoln Was Shot, mm. uh, which I think is a really good film about the Lincoln assassination. So perhaps some point in the future we'll take a look at that one as well. General Bogard. Uh, yes. Uh Donald Sutherland's PGT Beauregard. A uh, little, little running theme here with some of the historical movies that you've dissected in the past. Uh, he's just a 
tad too old to be playing the character. I think he's also about a foot too tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Beauregard was in his mid 40s, I believe, by the time the Hunley was out uh, scouring the waters off Charleston, and Donald Sutherland was in his 60s at the time of yeah. this, I believe. Well, don't roll him out too soon yet, because I, all in all, I think he does a really good job. Oh, fabulous actor, yeah. absolutely. Love everything he's in. Lieutenant? Lieutenant Dixon? Hinting at George Dixon's past there a little bit with the ghostly visage of his wife. Captain Hunley took the torpedo boat out today. And she sank under the Indian chief. The crew? John, sir. Captain Hunley? All hands lost, Lieutenant. Ooh. <laughs> That's hardcore. This is October 15th, 1863. This is the second time it had sunk. Mm -hmm. It had sunk beforehand in August of 1863 mm -hmm. as well. The first time it sank, five men died. The second time, as we just heard, everybody died, including Horace L. Hunley, the innovator behind all of this. Really, yes. He was the... Uh the chief financier for, for the Hunley throughout its creation. And I, I think it's as good of time as any to mention now that the Hunley was sort of a, a, the Mark III of Horace Hunley's submarine technology that they were tinkering around with at the time here. In the background of this funeral procession, uh, we see the old exchange building and dungeon, which is one of the really hallmark historic sites of downtown Charleston. And it has a history associated with piracy and the American Revolution. And it was there during the Civil War as well. And so I, I think the filmmakers did a really good job of trying to set the scene mm -hmm. within this historic city. Prior to the Hunley, he made two other submersibles. Uh, the first one was the, the Pioneer, which was the first and only Confederate submarine to earn a letter of mark during the Civil War, which essentially made it a, a privateer. So we had mm -hmm. some submarine piracy going about at the time. Why not? And uh, the second one was called the American Diver. And that one actually has a, a bit of an interesting history behind it in terms of the, uh, the mode of power. So while the Hunley had a uh, mechanical crank to power the, the propeller of the submarine, the American Diver, they actually tinkered with electromagnetic motors nice. to power it. Yeah, so I we had some, aware of that. Yeah, we had some engines going, some very rudimentary electric motors and uh, steam engines being put into these early submarines. So they're a little bit more advanced than people give them credit for. I will not further damage myself over this torpedo boat, I must say. I do like a plump from time to time. French Creole Playboy. Got Good old it. PGT. <laughs> that bombastic and a little bit fiery personality that Beauregard carried with him throughout the war. What do you think? She's seaworthy? You got the stuffing boxes. She needs to be clean. All right. Let's get ready by the end of the week. We'll just raise another crew. We'll take her out again. All right. So I'm glad that they included this scene in here um, because this is a little piece of Hunley history that is often left out of the textbooks. After the second sinking of the Hunley with the loss of all hands, including Horace Hunley himself, uh, the Confederacy essentially impressed 10 African-American slaves to uh, drag the bodies out of the Hunley after it was pulled up scrub it with soap and I, and I believe accounts even say that they doused it with lime mm -hmm. to get rid of that rot and the just the smell of death that was inside of this this iron beast and i think another important thing to underscore with this a uh, nice shot of uh the sub being repurposed shall we say 
Uh, and it's something that's often neglected in Civil War films, and that is the fact of just how essential enslaved individuals were to the logistics and the infrastructure of the Confederate war machine. Mm -hmm. In most movies, we see enslaved people picking cotton or cultivating tobacco. Very rarely do we actually see them working in a sort of industrialized setting. Uh, because they do work in factories, they work in the shipyards, they are the ones helping to salvage the Hunley and to repair it as well. Uh, and so I think it's a wise decision on the part of the filmmaker to incorporate that. Absolutely. Whether or not any of those enslaved characters could have been fleshed out a little bit more in the story, I, I think is a good point of historical consideration to think about. Mm -hmm. Here we see a nice shot of the distant federal blockade in the background. And the blockade at Charleston was just merciless because the United States Navy and the military as a whole saw Charleston as the cradle of secession. Mm -hmm. This was the nest in which the egg hatched, <laughs> so to speak. And they were not going to let up. Dive beneath an enemy ship, we'll throw that torpedo into its hull. Our purpose is to attack from beneath to destroy as many federal ships as it's going to take to break the blockade here. And you know, the, the naval side of the Civil War is, of course, I'm a little bit biased here as a, as a naval historian, but I think it's a side of the war that is criminally underrepresented in media. Oh, know? absolutely. Um, and it's, it's primarily due to the fact that obviously, you know, you cannot go to these these uh, these battle scenes that occurred in the water as right. you can on, on mm -hmm. land and like, as you would at Gettysburg or Vicksburg. You know, you, you can't really go to these grounds, walk the same paths that these individuals did 160 years ago. You know, it, it's just, it's harder for the public to grasp what happened at these, at these uh, scenes of battle, but they are nonetheless just incredibly important to the, the outcome of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And certainly the same is true, the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And another factor why a lot of people know less, let's say, uh, about the Battle of the Coral Sea versus Iwo Jima uh, is because it, there's no distinctive landmark mm. that's associated with it. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a great point on your part. I require seven more men. I need men able to stand confined places for long periods of time, able to work in intense heat, sometimes dark, but men without fear. Oh. Oh. Hasn't gotten his sea legs yet. Many don't. The boat is sunk twice while being tested. Five men were killed when she went down right here in Fort Johnson last summer. As you know, eight men drowned here just two weeks ago. I believe this is a safe machine if it is well operated. She is an unforgiving one as well. Volunteers, one step forward. Shocking that no one is stepping forward to volunteer for this suicide mission after uh, just being told of two previous sinkings. <laughs> Not much of an incentive. Tell me something, Lieutenant. Why are you army boys trying to do a Navy man's job? <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> you won't take my place, neither man. I do my fighting on the water, not under it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in some of its previous trial runs, especially, the Confederate Navy actually was in charge of the Huntley, and then its uh, ownership of sorts was passed over to the Army. Yes, um, it was originally a uh, sort of unlicensed privateering venture mm -hmm. on the part of uh, Horace Huntley and his uh, co-conspirators, if you will, here. Um, but yes, you're right, the, the Confederate Army, after seeing just kind of the slow progress of, of the submarine, uh, they took charge of it and um, and operate it from then on. Mm -hmm. And one of the common misnomers, though, about the H.L. Hunley, a lot of people call it the CSS Hunley, and even in this film it's referred to as the CSS Hunley on occasions, but it was never officially commissioned as part of the Confederate States Navy. Great point, yes. I'm sure it was something I ate. Don't try that in a submarine. Thank yeah, yeah. your pardon, but I am an experienced seaman just because I'm... Shelling Sumter again. 
Federal's got guns on Morris Island now. Just a point to echo um, from earlier is just the production design of, of this film. You know, that you can see the filmmakers went above and beyond with depicting Charleston as this, you know, war ravaged mm -hmm. and just absolutely deprived town. And there's, there's a very good reason for that at this point in the war. And that is the Union Navy's, uh, the cementation of their supremacy over the Confederate States Navy. And that was primarily due to one, uh, of course, the sheer uh, size of the of the U.S. Navy when compared to the lack thereof mm -hmm. of the Confederacy. And then another reason that I like to cite for, for people is that um, the, the ace up the sleeve of the Confederacy, it, its ironclads, had been effectively neutralized mm -hmm. around this time as well. Um, earlier in the war, the, the Union Navy struggled to really... Um, to really fight back against the Confederate ironclads in an effective way. And of course, this is seen at uh, various, various naval battles. Of, of course, the Battle of Hampton Roads, where it was essentially a draw. But beginning in 1863 with the Battle of Wausau Sound, Union monitors began to be equipped with uh, ever more powerful gunnery, chiefly the 15-inch Dahlgren mm -hmm. gun, which I wrote my master's thesis on and its effectiveness during the Civil War. And these guns could essentially take out any Confederate ironclad afloat. So um, one of the, the chief instruments that the Confederacy had for trying to break the blockade was now effectively neutralized, aside from some, from some occasions such as the, uh, the CSS Albemarle that operated within shallow waters. <laughs> We just saw uh, the historic St. Michael's Church, its uh, iconic bell tower being struck by one of these shells. I still need to read your master's thesis. You need to send it along to me. I highly recommend if you're into a heavy Civil War naval gunnery. All right. <laughs> famous gold coin yeah i i really do i do like these uh black and white flashbacks uh, this, these haunting episodes that beleaguer dixon's mind as the war rages on we'll get into whether any of it uh is up to snuff later on <laughs> And I do believe they did film most of this in the Charleston area. So oh, there you go. Yeah, and no reason not to get the facts right. Right. For a TV movie from the 1990s, really stellar special effects. I was just about to say, for a, a 90s television movie, this is going above and beyond what was required with special effects and set design. And I, I think they, they do the, the romance subplot in a, in a really good way here, because a lot of these historical films, it, they, they tend to like shoehorn in just these needless romances throughout these movies that I think take away from the main mm -hmm. historical plot. But this, I think it's, it's done very well. It's subtle. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not overdone. It's a great point. So, as we always do, I like to recommend reading material, and a really fascinating book, I think, on the Civil War is called A World on Fire. The subtitle is Britain's Crucial Role in the American Civil War, and it is by Amanda Foreman. And uh, as the thickness of this book would indicate, uh, <laughs> Great Britain had an integral part in America's Civil War, not only from its business ties, but various Britons who fought or participated in the war in one way or another. And one such individual was a London correspondent by the name of Frank Vizitelli. And Frank Vizitelli uh, traveled the world. Uh, he saw all of these wars. He traveled on a global stage when most people never went more than a few miles beyond their front doors. 
two decades after the Civil War, he goes missing in the sedan rather mysteriously. Uh, but he was witness to the shelling of Charleston in 1863. And I'd just like to read a portion of Foreman's book here because I think what we just saw is a really good representation as to what was really going on there in 1863 and 1864. At 10.45 p.m. on August 21st, 1863, a note from Union General Quincy Adams Gilmore was delivered to Beauregard's headquarters announcing the imminent bombardment of the city. He had neglected to sign it, so no one took the threat seriously. Three hours later, the shelling began. At first, I thought a meteor had fallen, but another awful rush and a whir right over the hotel and another explosion beyond settled any doubts I might have had, wrote Visitelli. He threw on his clothes and ran down the stairs, fighting his way past hysterical businessmen. One perspiring individual of portly dimensions, I love the language of the time, was trotting to and fro with one boot on and the other in his hand, and this was nearly all the dress he could boast of. Another, in a semi-state of nudity, with a portion of his garments in his arms, barked the shins of everyone in his way in his efforts to drag an enormous trunk to the staircase. Out in the street, women were running in all directions, their heads ducked, some carrying children in their arms. Many were stampeding toward the station in the wild hope that a train would be waiting to convey them away. Now that is a great first-hand account from this London correspondent who witnessed the shelling of Charleston. And it also speaks to the point that Charleston, all in all, is a pretty cosmopolitan place. There are people from a lot of different countries, including future members of the third crew of the H.L. Hunley. More on that to come. Another great little cameo here, tying in with another famous Civil War movie. We see United States Colored Troops prisoners mm -hmm. being hauled through the streets of Charleston. And perhaps these are members of the 54th Massachusetts or some sort of uh, other outfit as such that was fighting in the Charleston area. Uh, so uh, another great little uh, bit of acknowledgement here. Mm. And each man now gonna be called on to give his fullest measure to this boat and to each other. This vessel is a privateer ship. It's currently under the- The actor playing Wicks uh, has gone on to pretty great renown. It's Michael Stolbarg, and he's in Lincoln. He was in Boardwalk Empire. Uh, he's been in Scorsese movies. He's worked with Spielberg. Uh, and so it, it's interesting to see because a lot of the then unknown character actors in this film have gone on to fairly prestigious careers. Mm -hmm. First, Frank Collins. He's an Irishman. Hot tempered kid. I was looking for a fire. So just to hit on the point earlier about some of the, uh, the immigrants who were part of the Hunley's crew here, of course we saw a few of them in the, the little biographies given on the Hunley's crew there. And then toasting uh, there was also Lieutenant William Alexander, who was a engineer with the, I believe it was a volunteer regiment in Alabama. And he was also a, um, a British immigrant who arrived in the United States a couple years prior to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I think there were men from Great Britain, mm -hmm. Denmark, and Germany, as well as various southern states. And so it's uh, uh, a hodgepodge of uh, sailors and soldiers that make up this motley crew. Mm -hmm. So if, if I recall correctly, the dimensions of this were about 40 feet long in real life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see here is the third crew enters it for the first time. This is actually a little bit bigger than what the actual vessel was because they actually needed more room to fit camera <laughs> equipment in it and not to make the actors ill, I suppose. Um, so if you think it looks cramped here, it was actually worse in real life. Yes, less than four feet wide and I believe approximately four feet high. So 
Uh, you cannot navigate around the submarine in a standing posture in any way. These guys were crazy. <laughs> they, man. It just it, shows the, the desperation that was going on yeah, at the time. We have a, for sure. We have a hard time as contemporary audiences picturing, you know, what, what these men were, were, were fighting for and, um, you know, how dedicated to the cause they were. And this just shows that for them to enter into this, you know, just handcrafted submarine that sank twice, uh, they couldn't even stand in yeah. and had to power it with their hands. Uh, that, that just shows the, the dedication that these men had mm -hmm. to the, the Southern cause. Or they were adrenaline junkies, <laughs> which is a, <laughs> a little possibility. Bit of each, yeah. yeah. Now, below your seat, you're going to see ballast release bolts. These bolts hold your iron ballast to the bottom. Now, if there's an emergency, we don't wrench and see nothing. You simply unbolt, the release bolts will drop the keel ballast, will come right back up. Now I'll tell you what. Hanley and his crew tried that when they sang. Someone was not turning these boats far enough. We don't know why, but the fact remains, someone did not pay attention to his task. So while the, the Hunley was indeed uh, a primitive submarine by our, by our standards today, um, you can tell by the scene here that uh, these individuals have kind of learned from previous experiences and experiments with submarines and Indeed, the Hunley was by no means the first military submarine created. Of course, there was the, um, the Turtle from around the Revolutionary War period. And all throughout the, the 19th century, there were various submarines that were being made in, in Europe and North America alike. Um, various ones in uh, what is now Germany, France, the U.S., uh, and even Spain. Uh, there were individuals creating them. And Robert Fulton of, of mm. Steamboat... Uh, of fame. He even created the, the Nautilus, which he tried selling to the French military for use. As another fun side point, I've actually been in the recreated sub that was used for this movie. A, a year after this movie came out, my family and I actually took a vacation to Charleston, mm. probably in no doubt spurred on by how much I liked this movie as a fifth grader. And uh, it was in the lobby of Fort Moultrie, the National Park site. Okay. Um, I don't know where it is now. If you know, let us know in the comments <laughs> down below. We clear the harbor, we release it. And then when it's free floating, the triggers are exposed. <laughs> So here's a great reference to the fact that, you know, unlike many of the depictions we as modern audiences see of the Hunley now with the, the spar torpedo, which it used on its infamous attack, uh, the Hunley was originally supposed to tow this contact mine, which back then they called torpedoes. Anything mm -hmm. that, any explosive that floated on or beneath the water during the Civil War was called a torpedo. Um, but they were to tow this torpedo at the stern of their ship were the back of the submarine and it would float on the top of the water and what the Hunley would do was that it would dive beneath a Union ship, drag this contact torpedo into the side of it, have it explode and then surface on the other side, hopefully unscathed. But um, of course due to various technical issues with it such as the tow line getting tangled in the, sub in the Hunley's own propeller, um, they eventually abandoned that idea and adopted the spar torpedo that we see later on. All it takes is any one of these triggers to come in contact with the hull of the ship, and the torpedo blows. When we dive under an enemy ship, we have 150 feet of tow line to drag the torpedo into yeah, Right there's a good diagram of, of how it was planned to be used. Sir, I could swim like a fish. I am a fish. I was born to be underneath the waves. Watch this. I want to see this boy get some dry clothes and get some safe. <laughs> as good of a test as any, I suppose. <laughs> and yeah, you know, the the funny thing here, you know, it's, it's some welcome comedic relief in this otherwise very serious movie. Uh, but people in the military didn't talk like that in the Civil War. You know, it's like Full Metal Jacket mode. Yeah, certainly not in a, a privateer force in the Confederacy yeah. by any means. No. Yeah, uh, but. It works as a theatrical trope, mm -hmm. I suppose. Absolutely. And I like this scene because 
um, as we saw on the, the Confederate ship earlier, it was a, a, a nearly impossible task to get volunteers for the Hunley after the several sinkings that it experienced. But uh, over time, its mere presence within Charleston lifted the spirits mm. of, the, of the citizens just because you had this experimental weapon that by all professional accounts from uh, Confederate military members was going to break the Union blockade. And once again, by this, by this point in the Civil War, uh, Charleston was looking for anything mm. to break through the Union line of defending ships. Mm -hmm. So the, the Hunley was seen as this, as this miracle weapon that could yeah. do so. And it was kind of uh, the worst kept secret weapon <laughs> as well because the U.S. Navy knew that it existed. Mm -hmm. uh, they had spotted it. There were, of course, informants mm -hmm. that were within Charleston. Uh, and so they were always on the lookout for it uh, because they certainly didn't know if it was up to snuff, if it was uh, as lethal as Confederate propaganda wanted it to be. <laughs> Yes, there were very few secrets kept in the Civil War between the, uh, both spies on either side and then the press of all, of all sources. I mean, just yeah. you go back to the, the Battle of Hampton Roads and both sides knew exactly what was going to play mm -hmm. out there with both ships. So all of these secret weapons of the yeah. Civil War were, were not very secret. And Robert E. Lee himself said that one of his best means of intelligence was northern newspapers <laughs> that they were able to confiscate and acquire quite easily. Mm. The soundtrack very reminiscent of Gettysburg here. I love it. So you may know better than I, but did they construct a full-size replica of the Hunley for this movie? Uh, certainly, it was not an operable version mm. of, of the sub, uh, but they had an interior version and an exterior one that they could actually use on the water. And I believe it's just kind of a typical longboat that's mm. underneath it when you actually see it on the water. And then, of course, the interior shots were filmed in a studio. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting to see how they have what appears to be like these working mechanisms of the sub within the interior version. So mm. I, I think it's a pretty good recreation. It's convincing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm in the company. It's a dorm. Do no may. Don't, don't me wrong. May I ask a question? Why are you learning French? It's a language of love. For as cliche as this conversation may seem, uh, Americans were super in love with the French in the <laughs> 1850s and the 1860s. Uh, anything French was in style. Mm. Uh, we can look at the clothing, we can look at the, the catalogs, um, even the, the Zouave style uniforms uh, embraced especially early on in the conflict uh, by both sides. Uh, anything French was in style. I don't think it's a stretch at all. Uh, that even one of our sailors here would be desirous of learning it. Which is ironic because, at least in the naval space of the Civil War, uh, the French were, in a way, actively conspiring against the United States by uh, the creation of several ironclads for the, the Confederate Navy. Yeah, not to mention all the shenanigans going on down in Mexico. Yes, yes. At, at the same time. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so a bunch of power grabs indeed. Mm. Can I ask you a question? Why does Dixon carry that coin with him everywhere? It was given to him by his wife when he left for the war. It saved his leg at Shiloh. Is she with him now? No, she's dead. So I think that's as good a moment as any to talk about the background of this legendary coin that Dixon carries on. What, what do you know about it? So the, the legendary gold coin, this was at the heart of a mystery surrounding George Dixon and his involvement uh, in the Hunley's attack on the USS Housatonic. And for many years, it was questioned as to whether he was on the submarine when it happened. But um, when historians, archaeologists, and researchers found the coin on the submarine when it was raised, uh, that essentially solved the mystery that he indeed 
was on the Hanlei during its infamous attack. And um, I believe you can give a little bit of additional background. Ah, uh, yes, because of course there's a romantic element to this story as well. And I not only have a story, but I have a little bit of fun show and tell also. Oh no. The coin! <laughs> no, it's not the original one. Uh, so, uh, when I visited Charleston in my youth on a trip, uh, there was a museum, which I believe no longer exists, called the H.L. Hunley Experience Museum. Mm. And it was located not in Charleston, but at Myrtle Beach, at Broadway <laughs> at the Beach. And I remember this because it was right next to Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Margaritaville, and then there was a Hunley Museum right beside that. You can't make this stuff up. And one of the things that they sold in the gift shop was exact replicas of Dixon's coin with the bend and all. And it is an 1860 gold piece. And I'll, I'll tell the story about the engraving on it here in a little bit because the film is actually going to recreate mm. the moment that the bullet strikes this gold piece. Uh, but as we saw in an earlier moment of the film, his girlfriend hands it to him as a good luck token. And purportedly, according to the legend, the girlfriend's name was Queenie Bennett. It's a good Southern antebellum name, if you <laughs> ask me. And it's certainly a good story. Is it true though? We can't really say one way or another. Uh, did she give it to him? Did she really exist? Does she die? As is uh, mentioned here in the dialogue of the film, it's in many ways a big question mark, but a lot of it's probably rather fictitious and embellished, mm. uh, all done in the name of bolstering the mythical standing of the Hunley. Uh, but there you go, a, a cool souvenir, an exact replica of Dixon's gold coin. Very cool. Right next door to Margaritaville. <laughs> I'm sure there's a proper order to experience both of those places down there. You shot your mouth, Taybug. There it is. Mr. Collins, I outrank you and I am ordering you to sit down and be quiet now! I'm in the bloody navy, you pencil neck bastard! You need a good brawl here. <laughs> You know, I think it, it, it gets to something, though, uh, the fact that a lot of these immigrants who are happen to, happening to be in the South at this given time, they really don't have any sort of political conviction in fighting for the Confederacy. It was a paycheck. It mm. was a job. And maybe if the Confederacy won, it would offer them a degree of upward mobility. Uh, because immigrants were at the bottom of the societal rung uh, yeah. at the time. And so, for as much as a cliche as it is, the angry, drunken Irishman wanting to fight the world, <laughs> I think there's a, a degree of reality to his worldview here mm -hmm. at the time. He really doesn't have any skin in the game. Right, a lot of different motivations at mm -hmm. play here in the mm -hmm. war. No sense taking any chances, George. <laughs> I think we'll find them. At least they're bombing Sumter tonight, not Charleston. So we have a great little cameo here in a far off shot where we see Fort Sumter being shelled mm -hmm. by the U.S. Navy. A lot of people don't realize, even though they may know that the Civil War began at Fort Sumter as a U.S. installation, the Confederacy took occupation of it for the duration of the war. Mm -hmm. And it therefore became a target of the very military that had built it a number of decades earlier. And when you go and visit Fort Sumter today, there's very little of the original ramparts that are left. You know, it was like a fourth or a third mm. of it left. And that's because it was blown into oblivion and it became a heap of rubble by the end of the war and only the, the bottom foundations and lower walls of it uh, still exist today. So a nice little cameo of Fort Sumter here in the background. Absolutely. Another great flashback that we just saw, and it takes us to April of 1862 when the Battle of Shiloh mm. takes place, which was one of the, the truly big, great bloodlettings 
of of the war. That that, that battle was truly a a point of no return, and uh, Dixon is among the many many of casualties uh, inflicted during that fight. Uh, that turns out to be a resounding victory won by Ulysses Grant. And that brings us to the second half of our story about the coin. Mm. Uh, so, as we saw, he is shot in the hip. And this coin, not this one, <laughs> the one just <laughs> like it, the real one, was in his pocket and it undoubtedly saves his life or spares him from an incredibly serious wound that otherwise probably would have led to amputation. And when you were wounded in the Civil War, uh, the further up your limb that you were wounded, the lesser chance that you had of survival. And so a wound in your hip, it would not have bode very well for him. Uh, but in the aftermath of Shiloh, he had engraved on the back, Shiloh, April 6th, 1862, my life preserver followed by his initials engraved mm -hmm. on it. And so like you said, this was found on his remains in the sub, and forensic evidence also shows that the man who had this coin in the sub was wounded in the hip. Right. So fairly conclusive, I would say. Yes, that, definitely. That was George Dixon, and he was in fact wounded. Right. Yeah. And then as the, uh as the film kind of shows here, and I'm, and I'm glad they included this, uh, although he was spared from death, that absolutely mangled the, uh, him right near the hip up there. And throughout the movie, you can see uh, the actor portray Dixon with a limp. And indeed, mm -hmm. he had a limp up to the point where he was operating the Hunley. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine how difficult it was for him to get in to the Hunley with that wound? And how stiff and sore he would have been in that confined space once again recovering from that wound just once again like in a in a space that is less than four feet wide and yeah. four feet tall it's I, I can't imagine maneuvering with a with an injury like that that of course back then went untreated yeah unbelievable stuff yeah. I'm sweating just from watching that. <laughs> it would have been pitch black too. Oh, absolutely. You know, for the benefit of the audience, they have a little bit of uh, daylight mm -hmm. flickering in here, but when you're that far down, it, it'd be pitch black. That candle was the only source of light that these men yeah. had throughout the entire operation. And um, yeah, it was just hellish conditions cannot even begin to describe the, the experience in, in the Hunley. Some of the Civil War submarines that were being developed, and indeed by both sides, as the North had developed a few of its own submarines as well, most notably the, uh, the, the Alligator that was developed by the Frenchman Brutus de Villeroy. Um, this was a problem for many of the submarines of the period of, of how do we supply air to these men for mm. extended periods of time underwater. Um, the Hunley had a snorkel that they were supposed to you know, raise above the submarine and gather air via that, but unfortunately, and I believe the film mentions this, uh, it was inoperable come time of the attack. And uh, some other rather ingenious methods of, of air preservation and resupply even um, were being tinkered with at, at the time, one of which was on the, the Union's alligator. And that involved a, a chemical process where oxygen would be uh, refiltered mm. and supplied to the crew. Now. Evidence is pretty scant as to whether this actually worked because uh, the alligator was lost, unfortunately, as in, a, in the Civil War as a shipwreck. But um, yeah, you, you just see these various methods of, of air supply being tinkered with around mm -hmm. this time. These ironclads and submarines did not have long shelf lives. They did not, yeah. no. Uh, there is no complete ironclad of either side that still exists. And uh, the Hunley is... One of the few remaining submarines that, that we still have from the Civil War. So, we finally get a look at our brave submarine man. Care to join us for a drink? Well, I don't think I will. No, sir. You see, I only drink with fighting men. So a bit of fun, useless trivia here. 
Oh boy. All right. <laughs> so uh, we're from the area and one of the really notable museums in our area is the Railroaders Memorial Museum. And there's a, a number of like interactive and immersive films in that museum. And they were made for 1998 when that museum opened. Mm. And this actor, this playing this Confederate sailor, he's one of the actors in one of the films at the Railroaders <laughs> Museum. And uh, that was one of his like stepping stone projects before he went on to the big time and went on to be in a number of other films. So strange local museum connection that is of interest to absolutely nobody else. So but, <laughs> Once you're in the you know, genre, you just can't get out. Yeah, I, I suppose so. <laughs> But if you go into the exhibit called Kelly's Bar at the Railroaders Museum, you can see him as one of the bar patrons. <laughs> <coughs> you bastards. You're going to let him kill me. Say the gear. You know, with, with historical movies like these, there's always a need to fill in these gaps between mm. you know the records that we have today and, and what, what is missing from the time. But I must say that so far, this movie is doing an excellent job with like kind of padding out the, the story of the Hunley here with like the, the camaraderie building between the crew mm -hmm. and these little interactions. I just, I love it. The good character development too. You know, they're, it's kind of being peeled away and you get a, you get a little bit more of a sense of who they are. Mm -hmm. We're gonna move against the Wabash. Three hours out, three hours back. Anyone here think we can't do it? Uh, the crew of the Hunley did not have their sights set solely on the USS Housatonic for their entire operation. Um, indeed, there were other ships that they were, they were trying to target, and some of them of which were uh, actually some of the ironclads that were stationed in uh, Charleston Harbor, one of which was the USS New Ironsides, and there were a few monitor, monitors is there as, as well. Um, and there were actually going to be uh, prizes set out for the sinkings mm -hmm. of these vessels. The uh, new Ironsides, there was, uh, it was offered a $100,000 reward for its sinking. And then for each of the monitors, it was going to be offered $50,000. Wow. Yeah, quite a sum of money in 1864. Mm-hmm. Informants tell us that the rebels have built a diving torpedo boat. This infernal machine is capable of attacking from beneath the surface. All ships and ironclads in the inner blockading circle should have their fenders rigged out and a netting should be dropped from the ends of their fenders. So just to expand on your point earlier, um, the Union Navy indeed had knowledge of the Hunley being in the area alongside several other torpedo boats, which were called uh, David class vessels mm. that the uh, Confederacy was operating. And uh, John, Rear Admiral John Dahlgren, who was the commander of the Union's South Atlantic Blockading Squadron at the time, said as much in a, a piece of correspondence from January 7th, 1864. Uh, this read, there is also one of another kind, which is nearly submerged and can be entirely so. It is intended to go under the bottoms of vessels and there operate. This is believed by my informant to be sure of well working, though from bad management it has hitherto met with accidents, referring to the Hunley's previous two sinkings. There being every reason to expect a visit from some or all of these torpedoes, the greatest vigilance will be needed to guard against them. So the Union Navy was, was primed and ready for these infernal machine operations in and about Charleston Harbor. Expect a visit. How foreboding. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's show them what we have. One thing, Lieutenant. We all know what it's like not to be able to breathe down there. To try and soak air into your lungs when there's none. What's your point, Mr. Gunn? What I'm saying, what we're saying is if we get stuck on the bottom and there's no chance we're getting back up, we open the seacocks and flood the submarine. We drown quick instead of suffocate slow. As terrible as it sounds, that was unfortunately a pact that these men made that day. You know, they, they just experienced that, that dread of suffocating in a submarine during the earlier operation. Um, so it was decided that if all fails, we're just going to open the hatches and drown. It's a quicker death. you want something to look at, something to think about? I would if I had a picture of my arse. A bunch of sentimental Egypts. Another motivation there alongside everyone else is a little bit more Sorry. graphic, I'd say. Ah, <laughs> oh, again with a swimming lesson. <laughs> I got chains. What? Over the side. I 
hull is completely protected below the waterline. How could they know to do that? Don't matter, they know. So from some of the research that I did right before this episode, uh, I did not see anything involving the Hunley conducting an actual attack upon the Union ship depicted here, the USS Wabash, uh, that was lowering its chain netting within the water to, to deter submarine attacks. Um, but what I think this is, is obviously uh, some dramatization that they included within the movie, and then also kind of an amalgamation of some of the information that happened after the Hunley attacked the USS Housatonic. Um, then there was a, a Confederate torpedo boat, one of the David class vessels that I mentioned earlier. Um, one of those ships conducted an attack upon the USS Wabash unsuccessfully and was deterred by the chain netting around it. So I think the, uh, the movie makers here incorporated some details in after that fact, just to, you know, of course, pat out the runtime and mm -hmm. spice up the plot of the movie. Mm -hmm. it certainly builds the tension. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Were you expecting a musical number in this film? <laughs> I was not. <laughs> well, there you go. They sang the shells away. I'll be damned. <laughs> <laughs> I do declare. Spire torpedo. Mounted on the bow, but off the keel. Sawtooth harpoon, line your trigger. Make contact. You back away 150, 200 feet. Line your triggers the torpedo. So the movie's correct here in saying that uh, Beauregard provided the Huntley crew with the idea of using a, a spar torpedo. And just to expand for the audience here about, you know, what this weapon actually was. Um, so around the time of the Civil War, you know, there weren't, there were no self-propelled torpedoes as we know them today. Uh, there were experiments being conducted though in the North and the South with uh, rocket propelled torpedoes, but they were in very early stages of development. And humorously, I believe one test up in the north, they had two of these rocket propelled torpedoes, one of which veered off course, struck a bank. The other went past the target and blew a hole through the side of a, a Union Navy ship. So not the most successful mm -hmm. venture there. But uh, these more rudimentary forms of explosives, um, they were safer to operate, quote unquote, safer. And they were more tried and, and tested by this point of the Civil War. And what a spar torpedo was, essentially, was a harpoon with an explosive on, on the head of it, near this actual spar of it. And as the movie described here, uh, how it operated was the Hunley would essentially pierce the harpoon into a hull of a Union ship, back away, and then there was a trigger line that would be clicked and it would detonate the explosive and blow a hole through the side of an enemy ship. You fought at Shiloh, Dixon. Do you think I should have pressed on that first day while there was still light? A lot of people do. No, I'm asking what you think. Yes, sir, I do. Jefferson Davis said I wasn't fit to command an army. Oh, Beauregard's conversations about Shiloh here. It's really one of the great controversies and what ifs of the American Civil War, because at the Battle of Shiloh, his superior, Albert Sidney Johnston, had been mortally wounded. Command passes down to Beauregard. They had uh, swept the U.S. forces under Grant to a large extent off the field, gained a lot of territory, and Beauregard did not follow up. He did not press onward to the U.S. fortifications, and the speculation therein is that that allows the, the Union Army to rebound mm. and to regroup, and then they turn the tide the following day. Uh, and so it's one of the great what-ifs of the Civil War. And I like, I like this whole little conversation here with Donald Sutherland kind of playing out all the scenarios in his mind and rationalizing why he did what he did. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's uh, a good bit of historical retrospective in the script. Whatever you do, from that moment onwards, 
You are really just marking time. Isn't that right, Dixon? Yes, sir. Donald Sutherland really didn't have to go this hard for a television movie, but damn, does he... Does he doesn't go act. halfway. <laughs> Donald Sutherland knows how to act, and believe it or not, you know, he's one of these, you know, classic actors, you know, all the way back to the Dirty Dozen in movies from the 1960s. That guy has never won an Oscar. Like, at the very least, the Academy, you should give Donald Sutherland an honorary Oscar for his collective body of work. For just I the think. performance in the Hunley here, for God's <laughs> sake. I mean, he's, he's at least worthy of an <laughs> Emmy um, in this one. But uh, yeah. He's on uh, par with uh, some award winners that I've excellent seen. Excellent actor. Yeah. Can I be too careful? Yes, you never know when there's going to be a surprise attack by Driftwood. Nice little nod there to what the Union sailors thought the Hunley was upon approaching them, either a, a porpoise or a, a log floating towards them. Yeah, or just making fun of a gung-ho junior officer who wants to shoot his sidearm. <laughs> Pretty sure they exist in every era of firearms. <laughs> we will maintain 25 pounds of steam at all times and keep the engines reversed. Yes, sir. Let's hope we find something to fight. The production design on this is so good. Like the the bridge of this ship here. Yeah, mm. it's it, they just did such a good job. It's a lost art in a way. Like you don't see television movies committing that much in there. You don't see television movies about historical subject no, matter at all no. anymore. Maybe a miniseries here and there, yeah. but it's the best we can yeah. nowadays. I, mean, I can't remember the last time TNT made a historical TV movie. They just, they just don't do it anymore. Um, so, yeah. Like I said, the golden age, mm -hmm. the 1990s here. You've been ordered, Dr. Mobile. What? Why? Something about designing some new cannon. You ought to leave tomorrow. It's worth pointing out, it's in Mobile where the Hunley was constructed, and then it's later moved by train to Charleston, where most of this movie is set. So Mobile was kind of like this hub for sub-experimentation, and Charleston was merely the venue in which it was being experimented further. Right. And the Hunley team did hop around from area to area across the South. Mm -hmm. the, the Mark I version, the Pioneer, as mentioned earlier, that was built and operated in New Orleans, Louisiana, and then they hopped over when that failed to Mobile, as you said, built the next two there, and then went up to Charleston. You and me put this thing together, Will. Whether you're here or there, don't matter. It's your brains that run the boat. And your heart. That's very good of you. I'd best be off now. After the, the, the death of of Hunley, um, Dix and Al Alexander really did form this sort of um, this brotherhood together on this on this project. And indeed, after tragedy upon tragedy with this submarine, the, I'm, I'm sure the two were were uh, rather sad to see mm. in part ways afterwards. Yeah, it's the sort of project where it either makes you the best of friends or the worst of enemies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you realize. We need to be together in the name of survival or your opinions on uh, leadership and engineering are so adverse that you want to be at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, the extremes of either end. Thanks. Good luck to you. All right, Dan. His hand all busted up from fighting. <laughs> and cranking too, probably. Yeah. I can't imagine the other side of his hand looks any better. Although that scene was made for the movie, I mean, it makes you really think about like what was going through the minds of these men like, mm. on this on this fateful evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will mention just again here, even though the 
the legend of the coin may be somewhat embellished or apocryphal, it works so damn well as a cinematic device. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is such a good tangible in so so many ways, um, and the filmmakers use it to the utmost. Yeah, it's been several years since I've seen this movie. And I'm reminded here just how good a movie it is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's seriously a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oftentimes, I feel as historians that we look at these movies in, in kind of, like, rose-tinted lenses saying, like, oh, like, it's a, it's a lost breed of film that, you know, has its flaws and whatever, and we're kind of easy on it. But no, genuinely, like, for anyone out there that's even remotely interested in, like, history with the story of the Hunley, this is a pretty fantastic movie. <laughs> We see an African-American sailor hanging from the rigging here mm -hmm. with a telescope. And that too is a, a really good touch because while the United States Army was segregated, the United States Navy was not segregated mm -hmm. during the Civil War. And you can see ample historical evidence of this as black and white sailors um, sitting in a rather chummy fashion uh, on the deck of their, their sloops and battleships uh, and whatnot. So, um, another good acknowledgement here, uh, for as subtle as it may be. Yeah, and, and to that point, one of my favorite photographs from the Civil War is of the deck of the USS Monitor, and it depicts an African-American sailor seated on the deck. Yeah, to your point, it shows them just you know, being chums and comrades mm. with, their, with their fellow white sailors. Small quibble, but I believe uh, the Hunley attacked from the starboard side and not the port side as depicted in the film here. It's opposite, other the way around. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. so it, does it really matter? No, not really. No. But that's what we do on this channel. We, we <laughs> quibble about the, the little stuff, so <laughs> why not? The Houston Tonic had 12 guns, six on each side. I'm not actually sure if they fired any rounds I, I the Hunley as this was happening. I don't believe they did simply because of the fact that they couldn't properly uh, depress their guns uh, yeah. enough mm -hmm. to fire into the water. Pretty impressive stunt work there with all the guys flying through the air. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the irony of ironies, though, is that the explosion killed five men, and it was almost doubly deadly for the men in the submarine who inflicted that fatal blow yes. on the ship. So it's uh, not a good track record here still. No, 21 Confederate seamen dead as a result of the Hunley, and just five Union sailors. Yeah, so... Four to one. Yeah. yeah. Was it worth it? It's up for the audience to decide. There you go. <laughs> this exact clip right here uh, that has been discredited. Uh, there was no blue light. Mm. Uh, there, there could not have been any blue light, as we will further explain. That was. Yeah. They didn't find one inside mm -hmm. when when they started excavating the interior mm. of the sub. Although, um, at Battery Marshall, one of the Confederate positions here within the harbor, uh, they did say that they saw a blue light, but it was probably like a small handheld flare or something like that. Mm. And I believe one of the US Naval officers that was on the Housatonic saw the light as well. And so it was some sort of, uh, small ignition flare or something like that, but it was not a lantern. Right. Um, now, the, the filmmakers, I think they were using the historical scholarship and writing that was available at the time. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good little detail when you think about it, because th that story about the blue lantern was in a lot of books and references about the Hunley, mm -hmm. but the archaeological evidence now shows us that there was no such lantern on the ship, it was a clear glass lantern right. that was on the ship. So, no, and to that point, uh, for the audience to keep in mind, the 
Although the Hunley was located by the time that this movie was made, it mm -hmm. was not raised right. until 2000. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Like you said, we had researchers had no idea about right. like the contents of the submarine, right. if any of these myths about the lights were true. But um, yeah. Yeah. more on this to come. Yeah, good detail to have in the movie. Kudos to the actors for filming these underwater scenes, too. <laughs> Has to be difficult. Imagine. So, a very evocative, emotional ending, I would, dare I say. Yes. Um, and... Given the information, or perhaps lack of information, that the filmmakers had about how the crew really died, I think this was as, as best a way to end the story as possible, mm -hmm. rather than having something like an instantaneous death. I mean, you, you did, there's no time for the characters to come to terms with their mortality. You lose the sense of camaraderie at the end that you get in, in this depiction of the film. Mm -hmm. I think it's very effective filmmaking. I think uh, it, it works very well. And I think there's uh, vibes of Titanic in it as well. You know, it came out just two years prior to this film. I did get some musical scores like some hints here and there I'm yes like, oh, yeah is that a little bit of the titanic it's, soundtrack it's, it's very very emotional it's it's very well done cinematically but as the forensic evidence has shown us in the 20 plus years since this isn't quite how it happened so enlighten our audience as to uh what some of the scientific evidence suggests so um as you mentioned, you know, it would be terrible if the story of the Hunley ended so suddenly and uh, anticlimactically. Mm. But in fact, that is exactly what happened, or at least what many historians and scientific researchers now think would happen. So I observed within the movie here that at the time, it, I think it incorporated um, a few of the, the, the primary theories as to what happened to the Hunley and why it sank. So in the, in the final act here, uh, we saw a bullet being fired through the conning tower window, um, breaking the glass and thus allowing water to flood into the submarine. Uh, we saw the explosion shock wave travel through the submarine and uh, pop out a few rivets, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was the, uh, the crew's agreement on flooding the submarine should it not be able to rise again. However, um, some modern research conducted primarily, or spearheaded, I should say, by Dr. Rachel Lance in her wonderful book, uh, as we will now show you here, as best of time as any, I suppose. Um, excellent book, by the way. I use this a lot in some of my uh, academic papers throughout my master's degree because mm -hmm. I expanded upon my interest of the Hunley in some, uh, in some contemporary settings. But yes, excellent book here by Dr. Rachel Lance. Um, but she explored the theory that the the concussive shock wave from the Hunley's torpedo reverberated throughout the Hunley. And because it was so powerful of a shock wave, it mm. instantly killed the crew. I, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact medical terminology of it, but um, it's pretty gruesome the way that she, mm -hmm. she theorizes they would have died. I believe their, their lungs would have just been almost liquefied, their brains just, ugh. And as, essentially, speaking of the Titanic, they would have met a fate very similar to the ill-fated tourist submarine venture to the Titanic. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, very quickly, instantaneous, gruesome. Mm -hmm. The one saving grace, though, is that they never would have known what hit them. Exactly. That's what she says in her in her book and through her research is that, you know, there was there was no way that they could have known that having the torpedo that close in proximity would have instantly killed them. I mean, the, the, the science just wasn't there were well known enough at the time of the Civil War for them to realize that this is going to be a suicidal venture if we go forward with the, the spar torpedo option. And indeed, that's, that's what probably happened. You know, not every historian has agreed upon this as ironclad proof of this is how the Hunley sank that night. But... Um, through the research that she conducted on scale models, you know, scientific measurements, you know, conducted 
with actual explosive charges, mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say that this is likely what happened to the crew. And she's experienced in underwater blast trauma. So this is not this is not a scientist venturing off of yeah. her primary. It's not an amateur. Yes. Yeah. She knows what she's talking about here. So I'm inclined to believe off of the evidence that she provided that this is indeed what happened to the Hunley. And I believe in her book, I was trying to locate this online and some of the, the resources I had access to, but um, there were even theories shortly after the Civil War that like a, a blast wave would have would have killed could have killed mm -hmm. them. So this isn't entirely new speculation, but she has provided some solid scientific proof that you know this may have probably occurred on that evening. Mm -hmm. And once again, the book is in the waves by Rachel Lance. Mm -hmm. Great book. A lot of fascinating insight. And luckily for us as historians and anybody else interested, uh, you can schedule an appointment to go see the H.L. Hunley at the Warren Lash Conservation Lab, which is right outside of Charleston. Yes. Uh, so go and see it yourself. Uh, it is still a working investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what makes it so fascinating and so enduring. So I have an additional book recommendation here as well. Unfortunately, I do not have a physical copy with me, um, but you can find it, you know, through ebook format and physical formats as well. Uh, it is called Submarine Warfare and the Civil War. I know we're pretty on the nose <laughs> title, um, but it is by Mark K. Reagan, and it has been rightly described as the Bible for Civil War submarine researchers. And I use that extensively, and I mean extensively in my undergraduate capstone paper. I mean, it has, it has submarine vessels that, you know, haven't even been given a proper name because they aren't even, such little research has been done on them. Mm. Um, and he goes in depth. Look what I did there, in depth. Uh -huh. <laughs> more, 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 more fun. <laughs> um, but he goes in depth with just, you know, the possible dozens of submarines that were being like created during the Civil War and all these, just very, very like just underground operations that were occurring. So if you have any interest in exploring this topic any further, I highly recommend Mark Reagan's book. Once again, it's called Submarine Warfare in the Civil War. It's a very deep subject. Mm -hmm. One last one. <laughs> <laughs> Snuck that in there. All right. So that wraps up this episode of Real History. Dustin, thank you so much for joining this. You, you added a lot to the conversation. I applaud your research. I'm very proud of you as a former pupil. Well, and I expect many great things on the horizon. I appreciate it. It was good to be here. Glad to discover this movie and, you know, gain a further appreciation for some of the, the 90s TNT historical. Uh huh. There you go. And I will also say for all of my professional colleagues out there and museum administrators, newly minted graduate student for hire, he is available. He is looking. Uh, so if you want this awesome guy to be working at your historic site, get in touch with us and I'll link you up. <laughs> I gotta, you got to give the plug. Yeah, there at the end. You have to, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us once again. And until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious. Take care, all. <laughs>